we're looking at problems with probability judgments. So we've looked at the, the base rate neglect problem, which we've, we've seen spoken about, and insensitivity to sample size, and of course misconceptions of chance, things like the gambler's fallacy, and things like hot hands. So either so misinterpreting either imagining that in a random sequence that trends must reverse themselves, right, at a given point in time, or believing that trends can go on too long. Right? So people generally, humans, are not very good at understanding how random processes actually work. Which is a problem, right? Because so many of the decisions that we make are essentially decisions about random variables. So getting the behavior consistently wrong has implications for the, the quality of decision making. The next one is the the question of being insensitive to predictability, that is not taking enough account of the factors that can affect how predictable an outcome is. Right, so, for example, if people are asked to predict the profit of a firm in a number of years' time, right, the profit performance, and they're given descriptions of the firm, what you tend to find is people who are given quite positive descriptions of the firm will predict their profit performance will be good. Right? People who are given less positive predictions will predict their profit performance will be low. Right? And that's all the information they're given. Now, even when those predictions or those descriptions don't even really refer to the current profit performance of the firm. Right? So even if they say something like, you know, the firm's just like dynamic, innovative, you know, all of these positives, but without saying, and by the way, they're currently you know, highly profitable, there's no information about profit, but a positive message leads to a prediction of higher performance than a negative message, even though there's no real information in there about profit. And that ignores all of the other things. So people base their assessment only on that kind of piece of information, ignoring all of the other information which, we, which would, you'd need to have, right? You'd need to say, well, I need to know all of these other things before I can make a prediction. Exactly right. So there's, there's all of the things that you would need, you know, that would lead to whether or not you'd expect a particular firm to do well or badly. There's lots of other information. But again, people ignore that and tend to focus on that initial information. Right? So, and why? This is representativeness because you think, well, look, when a company, companies which are described as being innovative and dynamic and so on, you'd expect them to be profitable. Right? There's the association between the description and the outcome because the, the outcome of being profitable seems to be representative or represented by that description of the company in positive terms. Similarly, there was an experiment, you know, experiments have been done with even people who are training to be teachers where they're given a paragraph describing the outcome of a student's student teaches one practice class. Right, so a paragraph describing how it went, and they have to kind of rate that on a percentile rating of how good it is, right? 100, you know, from 100, 0 to 100, 100 being obviously the best and 0 being the worst. So they get a rating of the performance in this class test. And then they're asked about ratings of, you know, predictions of where, how this person will perform as a teacher in five years' time. Right, and what you find is that the ratings are basically identical. So what people are really doing is basing their prediction of how good someone's going to be as a classroom teacher in five years' time on the basis of one, a description of one practice test. Right, so there's no real variation between, so there's no sense in which someone's, people say, well, I can't possibly tell what they're going to be like, I don't have any other information. The fact that they did well, apparently, in a class test, one class practice class, is enough for them to predict they're going to do equally well. So if they, if they rate their performance in the class at 90%, they tend to rate their predicted performance as a teacher in five years as a full-time teacher at 90%. Right, so ignoring all of the other information that can go in, that would need to go into working out whether someone's going to be successful as a teacher or not. Now, once again, a good a good performance in the practice test is taken as being representative of being a good teacher. And so they draw the inference from that information even though they would know that there's no link between how somebody does in one practice class and what they're going to be like five years later. 
Right. So that, that bias creeps in quite a lot in the way that people actually make probability estimates. Right, the illusion of validity. It's where people get the idea that something works, some method works, right, even if there's no reason to believe that. So, for example, <clears throat> psychologists, right, psychologists who do selection interviews. So when people go for job interviews, they do like a kind of a clinical interview with a psychologist as part of the selection procedure. Often, will express confidence in the their confidence in their kind of findings out of those interviews. Right? So they treat them as being a kind of a you know a valid instrument, even though they know from the literature, right? the established research literature says these things are basically useless. It doesn't improve, doing this kind of thing does not on average improve the quality of selection of candidates. Right? They're actually quite a poor instrument. But people who use them right, will simultaneously express great confidence in what they get out of these interviews when they're, when they're actually providing advice to the person doing the employing, even though they would be aware of that result from the literature. These instruments, in fact, are not very good at all. Right? So there's a Again, a representativeness going on there that, well, a bad performance in this selection interview or, you know, a negative outcome of this selection interview, clinical selection interview, should mean that someone's going to be a bad employee. That's the basis of the judgment they're kind of clinging to, even though the information in, in aggregate, which is available, is that the relationship is very weak. So the illusion is there because they seem to fit together that this thing's a valid instrument or a valid basis for making a decision. All right, so alternatively, say I've got, say I pull a, a student at random and you've got their first year results, two students at random, right? Got their first year results, student A, student B. Student A got all credits in first year. Student B got 50% Ds and 50% Ps. If I ask you to predict the final GPA at the end of the degree for each of those students, which one would you be more confident about, A or B? True. You're not supposed to be that reasonable. <laughs> no, no, that's right. No, well, I, but just to say you had to make, just say you had to make. Okay, you have to make a prediction, right? I ask you to predict in both cases, which which one do you think you'd have more confidence in? Even if the ba even if the base rate for both was low, which one would do you think you'd have more confidence in? Like it's a comparison. A, right? Why? Consistency, right? Exactly. But they're consistently mediocre, or consistently like credits. Mm -hmm. so it is in the first year knowledge, so it's a high distinction from the other person who could have been based on higher knowledge. All right. A common finding is again is that consistency is used as a powerful basis for prediction, in the sense that people feel that a consistent pattern. So a, that's a fairly common answer for that kind of problem is A. People feel more confident about A than, than B because of the consistency. Right, so there's a strong tendency to look for consistency of patterns as a basis for making predictions. Now, in a sense, this is open to an objection about being an illusion of validity as well. Because if you have little variation, that could be a sign that Essentially, some of the, if you've got little variation in the sequence like that, that could be a sign that some of the variables there are redundant. Right? And so, from a statistical point of view, if you think about if you've done econometrics, it's similar to the problem of multicollinearity in linear regression. If you have too much correlation between your explanatory variables, they tend to move together, then they don't provide as much information as if they were uncorrelated and move independently. So in a sense, from a statistical decision-making point of view, having variation means having more information. 
having less variation means having less information. From that, so in that sense, the consistent pattern should be less preferable than the inconsistent pattern. Quite often. Right, so the, the idea of reasoning from, well, a consistent pattern means I'm going to have a more confident prediction is ignoring that whole possibility of intercorrel of correlate mutual correlation and therefore a lack of information as opposed to the information you get from uncorrelated variables moving independently. Right, so reasoning immediately from consistency to a greater confidence in prediction itself can be an example of the illusion of validity. Like misconceptions of regression. Now, where we have, where we have things which are not not random variables, but things which display regression to the mean. Right, so, when things are going to move around a mean reverting, they're going to move around a mean. Then, in that case, it's not really a case of the gambler's fallacy to expect a change. In, you know, the upward movements are going to be balanced by downward movements. Right? When things move around a mean, you expect there to be some kind of regression. Well, you should expect there to be some kind of regression. And what you should expect is that kind of movement, so, so upward movements away from the average will be corrected by movements down towards the average, and downward movements will be corrected by movements back towards the average. Right? Because we're not talking necessarily about stochastic processes here. Right? We're talking about with independent trials, we're talking about something which in a sense is, is fluctuating around a mean, and there is an underlying average. So you should accept that. You should expect that to happen. The problem is that can be misinterpreted. It can have fairly kind of dramatic consequences. One of, one example of which was un, uncovered in the training of kind of pilots. Right. Well, they found that people doing the training had come to the conclusion that rewards, verbal rewards, were useless. So praising people was useless, whereas punishing people was effective. So in terms of training, they were constantly, you know, ripping into bollocking people for making mistakes and not giving any kind of reward or praise if they did it correctly, which seems to go against the normal kind of psychological thing about, you know, that, that you should be kind of bolstering performance with a positive feedback, you know, and... And, yeah, so you should have more of a bias towards positive than negative feedback. They developed this whole culture where there was no positive feedback and it was all negative. Now, why was that? Well, because they'd noticed that quite often when someone did, say, a good landing and they were praised, the next time they do a landing it might be worse. That it's a deterioration. And they'd noticed that when someone had done a bad landing and they got, uh, you know, strips torn off them, quite often the next time they did a landing it was better. So they concluded that rewards make people act worse and punishment makes them act better. Rewards are useless, they lead to deterioration. Punishment makes people perform better. Right? Now what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that, that's a, that's a misconception of regression. Because quite often you'd expect, right? if someone has an average level of performance, you would expect if they, they're above their average, they put in a performance which is above average, you'd expect quite often the next time you'd have something which is worse than that, right? Because they've got an underlying average level of performance. So when they do well, quite often the next time they do it, it's not going to be as good as that because we've got a kind of fluctuation around a mean. And when someone does badly, they're not going to continue to do badly in a long sequence uh, below their average performance. So uh, below average performance is quite likely to be followed by a better performance. That's the nature of something which is kind of kind of be mean reverting. It's got nothing to do with what the rewards or punishments actually are in the first instance. You'd expect that kind of a pattern to be there. Now, of course, you could affect it in some way. Right? It depends how bad a bollocking you gave somebody for making a mistake. Right? You could shatter their confidence so much that they, they could go completely to pieces. Right? But you would expect there to be this underlying pattern of movement that is a good performance could easily be followed by a bad one and a bad one could easily be followed by a good one. The mistake is to associate what the action that's taken with the outcome, ignoring the underlying, if you like, natural variability. And then you end up in a situation, of course, where 
someone who's rewarding people, if this idea takes place that rewarding is useless, someone who's rewarding people themselves end up being punished for doing so, and someone who's punishing people all the time would end up being rewarded for doing that. Right, so it's a kind of a, a little bit of a human tragedy that this misconception of regression problem, again, the misunderstanding of how processes like that work, can end up causing a situation like that where, in fact, it's concluded that the only way to motivate people is to bash them around if they make a mistake. And so once again, that comes from the idea that people don't really fully understand or comprehend easily. The human brain isn't really set up to deal with how probabilistic processes play out over time. 